participants today we will be discussing a very you know pertinent topic within this mooc courses on natural resources management and that is on the issue of climate change vulnerability and adaptation in the field of natural resource management i am sure that uh, most of you you know heard about climate change a lot vulnerability and adaptation also probably some of you have already heard so in this uh, lecture actually i will divide this lecture again in part 1 part 2 part 3 like that what we are going to do is that we'll start with uh, you know few basic concept of climate change vulnerability adaptation and then you know we will look at that how climate change actually interact with the natural resource management and how actually it could affect the overall you know well being and especially within that natural resources management paradigm so this particular you know topic is very very what you call pertinent at the present context very contemporary topic and i hope that together we will have you know a good discussions and also in one of the upcoming live sessions if you all are interested i would you know go into further detail depending upon your uh, queries or doubts let us start today with the few basic ideas and concept of climate change vulnerability adaptation when we talk about uh, climate change basically we talk about the average statistical average of weather events over a period of 50 to 100 years remember there is a significant difference between weather and climate many a times what happen is that we often uh, a mistake considering weather event or change in weather event as change in climate so at the very beginning i would like to clear that confusion doubt weather is instantaneous today what what you have if you have a rain that is weather but that rain event of today if this day over a period of say 30 40 50 years or this september month if you suppose capture it over a period of 20 30 40 50 100 years and then you take the average statistical average of that particular event of rainfall and if then you see certain change you know in the precipitation or rainfall with you know year then we can say that yes there is a change in the one of the climatic parameter that is precipitation or rainfall but only one or two years of changes in in an event like this would actually call change in weather not in climate now there are two major drivers associated with climate change two drivers which actually trigger the change in climate and these two drivers are natural drivers and anthropogenic drivers that means that there will be some natural phenomena which will actually trigger climate change and there will be some phenomena which are purely man made that could also trigger climate change we will discuss all those things ex with example in due course of time now changes in the atmospheric you know abundance of greenhouse gases greenhouse gas when we call methane carbon dioxide nitrous oxide even water vapor and many other things okay which you all of you know so what happen is that that the incoming solar radiations suppose you here you have sun and the radiation comes in and then here is your earth surface soil surface it hits some of them is return backs here you have a kind of a blanket in the atmosphere which are actually made of greenhouse gases okay a thick blanket now some of this radiation 
actually can absorb by the earth surface some actually gets reflected. This reflected rays actually become from the short wave which coming from the sun after striking the ground it becomes long wave. So, short wave can penetrate much faster long wave is little less in energy. So, they go back what happen is that these gases the blanket will absorb part of this return radiation and that is how what happens this blanket will absorb and then re radiate some of the heat in your ambient environment and thus our ambient temperature will increase. Okay. But this total phenomena is purely natural and it is important and I could say that it is beneficial also because this is what allows the life to you know get form in this universe because this phenomena of greenhouse gases allows your ambient temperature to be around 15 degree centigrade which is conducive for different various life form to come into this universe. Now, if you you know start thickening this greenhouse gas blanket with pumping in several type of greenhouse gases other than natural resources from anthropogenic sources like industry, air condition system, various kind of you know emissions from various kind of industry. What happened is that this blanket become much more thicker. So, what happened is that the returned radiation which some of them gets absorbed some actually pass through and goes back to the galaxy where from it has come. But if it becomes thicken then what happen that these rays long wave return rays cannot pass through they will also get captured here and then re radiate into the ambient air. So, that means more gases will be there more energy more radiation will be trapped. So, re radiation will be higher and ambient end temperature will be much higher. This is what is actually in brief you can say simplest way one can explain the global warming phenomena due to climate change. So, now these are actually few triggers already drivers that I have mentioned. So, changes are often known as radiative forcing changes which acts as you know indicator to depict the impact of natural and anthropogenic factor which, which actually impact our climate change. So, different natural drivers like greenhouse gases emissions like nitrous oxide methane these are all uh, coming in and getting packed here and the layer becomes thicker and thicker. So, anthropogenic or human causes are one of the major drivers for this kind of changes. Now, there are various sources of these gases that we just discussed in the previous slide. It could be industry, it could be even agriculture very very small amount various other sources. Now, climate changes cause an increment in the sea surface temperature also okay? and different sea surface temperature indices like El Nino, La Nina, IOD, Indian Ocean Dipole these all things you might have heard these are all different even due to climate change is taking place. And the frequencies of increment of drought, flood, sea level rise these has you know become very very frequent these days and that is the worry and that some expert scientists are attributing to the climate change. So, that is the overall you know concern that the that the global community has on climate change. Now, if you look at I just now mentioned now that uh, greenhouse gases phenomenon in brief how actually the global warming take place. Now, there are few parameters few parameters are involved in climate change business and because of any change in these parameters climate variability takes place. Now, what is climate variability? Climate variability actually denotes the deviation over a given period of time from the business as usual when compared to a long term statistics as I said for the same calendar period. 
as I said the example of rain in September this year, next year 20, 30, 40 past years data if you find then you carry out a statistical analysis that statistical average you plot and then if you find there is a change in the trend you say that there is a change in the climatic parameter which is rainfall. Now climate variability is defined as the variation in the mean state and other statistics of the climate on all temporal and spatial scales. Remember this is beyond individual weather event. Today th there is heavy rainfall, it is an weather event. We should not say climate is changing just because of one day, two days, three days, a year of heavy rainfall or less rainfall. Climate variability is measured by this kind of deviations which we call as anomalies. Now variability may be due to natural you know various internal processes within the climate system because you have atmosphere, earth surface, then albedo phenomenon, then greenhouse gas blanket, then aerosol presence of moisture and many things it is happening within the system internal system of, of climate. So any change due to a natural internal process within that climatic system is actually known as internal variability. Okay? So internal variability of climate is when it takes place within the climate system not you know impacted by any external factor and this internal variability is almost beyond our control. So we do not have much role to regulate that directly. Now variability can also occur due to variation in natural and anthropogenic various external factors like I said that you know our lifestyle, industry, even say agriculture practices, some of the agriculture practices. So these all are actually external factor and these are anthropogenic mainly. So we have control on that. The entire game of climate change management lies here on the external variable, external variability. So that is where we have actually control or regulation. Having said that, if we consider that okay, we do not have much you know role or regulating power with the internal variability of the climate system, but we have some amount of control on the external variability which actually happens because of us, our activity. Now if we are the cause of the problem, then certainly the solution lies within us. And then when we come, the human factor comes into picture, then comes various other concept. One of them is adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity or adaptation capacity of individual. Now I am here sitting in a room giving a lecture to all of you. Now in this lecture, suppose it is very comfortable, suppose air condition is running and I am comfortable. But another person after me comes for another lecture in the same place and he requests the people here that please increase little bit the temperature, I am feeling very cold. Now you see to individual to individual adapting with some you know environmental factors or any change per se is very different. Now same temperature where I was feeling comfortable and giving lecture to you with lot of you know energy and happiness. Other professor comes in and he requests to increase the temperature and he told that he is feeling very cold and that is his adaptive capacity. Now the other person probably is feeling uncomfortable. Now he has the control to change it so he requested to increase the temperature. But if that particular air condition system cannot be regulated or change increase or decrease. Suppose for some man functionality it is fixed at 25 degree centigrade or 22 degree centigrade. Then what to do? Then the other professor has to look for jacket so that he, he can increase his adaptive capacity. Now he can get the jacket only then when he has money, 
when he has money resources to buy that jacket so if he has money then he can buy the jacket and that is how he can increase his adaptive capacity sometime people say coping capacity so the coping capacity or adaptive capacity can be increased if you have money in pocket and that's where is another aspect comes if, if some person doesn't have money he has to suffer the change the change in the climate or change in the system you see in this example i have mentioned many things one is the individual differences towards a change where i i feel comfortable another person feel uncomfortable second i say that if the change in the system can be adjusted then you adjust it but if it cannot be adjusted then you have to enhance your adaptive capacity to adjust and to enhance that adaptive capacity to adjust you need to buy a sweater or a jacket or suppose in some places is very very rainy rain has increased umbrella water coat so if you have money you can also enhance your adaptation so the finance part also i have given an you know example within this single example so i think that you have understood exactly this is the you know basic contention of climate change and that is was the difference between rich and poor so climate change that's why hurts the poor much because they don't have the capacity to buy and enhance buy something which they require and enhance their adaptive capacity adjust with the changes so that's why impact of climate change you can see could be severe for people with less resources than people with large amount of resources so from this argument the thing comes that resource poor people resource poor countries should be helped more for adjusting this change in the climate all right so you see that now next fundamental one thing concept comes is exposure exactly again the same example that i have given on classroom and two teachers exposure is the presence of the people a livelihood species a ecosystem environment function services resources infrastructure finance social and cultural assets assets in places or settings where those could be adversely affected so that is your exposure like the exposure for me and my another teacher here in this same room could be exposure to the chillness because of the air condition hazard the potential you know appearance of a natural or human induced physical event or a trend or a physical impact which may cause loss of life injury or any other health impact as well as damage and loss to property infrastructure livelihood service provision ecosystem environmental resources etc etc so hazard usually refers to climate related physical events such as drought flood hurricane etc impact already you might have understood effects on nature nature or human system because of any changes in the climatic system all right so when our people life livelihood health ecosystem availability of natural resources or any other resources becomes at stake or in danger due to some changes in the climatic condition then it is already impacted the impact of climate change is visible all right so just a quick recall of this particular aspect that we discussed so i gave an example to make you understand that what is adaptation what is adaptive capacity what is exposure how adaptive capacity can be changed through the power financial power or resources poor who don't have money can get more affected so various issues has come from one single example we will move to the next other concepts which are involved with the climate change risk risk already we have different kind of risk right in this ecosystem in our life 
climate change is aggravating that situation. Okay? So, what happened is that suppose say case flood, flood was there 100,000 year back and now also. What is that new thing that climate change has brought? It has aggravated, increased the frequency and so the risk associated with flood or associated with drought has increased. Okay? This is what actually the link between risk and climate change. Sensitivity. Sensitivity we discussed remember in modeling classes. So, it is the degree to which a system or a species get affected because of any change in the environment or in the ecosystem. But remember they might get affected positively or also negatively because if climate change takes place in some cases it might enhance rainfall, temperature, humidity. So, some crops or some animal who like this kind of environment they will enjoy and they will flourish. But the in the same location if there used to be a dry cold weather, so the animals plants all were accordingly were available there. Now, suddenly if that area becomes warm, rainy, humid, what will happen? The existing system, flora, fauna, plants, animals, they will face stress and over a period of time you would see that there might be a change in the flora and fauna because you know any life form naturally start adjusting with the change in its environment. Next is vulnerability. Vulnerability is the propensity or predisposition to get adversely affected. Now, you tell me the example that I have given in this room, me and my colleague another professor coming in feeling two different kind of thing. I am comfortable, but he is feeling very cold and uneasy. So, that means the other person is vulnerable to cold temperature. Means if temperature goes down, he feels uncomfortable. So, he is vulnerable. Vulnerability also encompasses a variety of concepts and elements including your sensitivity or susceptibility to any kind of harm, lack of capacity to cope and adapt. So, one person if I say that highly vulnerable to cold temperature means he is susceptible little bit of drop in temperature he or she will feel uneasy. Okay? This vulnerability of individual can be evaluated through vulnerability index because we need to know right that if I say that he is vulnerable how much vulnerable? If there are two individual both are vulnerable we need to then compare no? he is more vulnerable than he or she is more vulnerable than her. We have to then do some kind of analysis. Vulnerability index is a matrix actually characterizing the vulnerability of a system. Climate vulnerability index is typically derived by combining with or without weightage. Several indicators actually assume to represent vulnerability in the field of climate change. Okay? Now, let us see the risk that I mentioned here, how to manage the risk management and assessment framework. If we find that there is a risk, how actually we can manage that? Now, this is a framework given by IPCC in its 2014 report and what do you see in this figure? You see an hazard, you see vulnerability, exposure, adaptation. Now, suppose you have one hazard, flood or drought. You imagine as per your wherever from you are, if in your area flood is an issue, you imagine flood, if in your area drought is an issue, imagine drought. Now, if you are exposed to that particular hazard and if you are vulnerable, then there is a high chance that you are, you are going to be impacted by that particular hazard. because there will be an impact of this hazard, this impact on your socio-economic processes, socio-economic pathways, adaptation, mitigation action, governance. These impacts can also you know change the climatic system itself through natural variability 
or anthropogenic climate change. These two things, two drivers that I mentioned. So these are two drivers and these are the aspects which can get affected. Now you see that vulnerability, hazards and exposures, these three are actually interacting and in the center you get risk, right? So risk is very much is a component of these three together, vulnerability, hazard and exposure. You find that this risk is somehow related to all these three drivers, vulnerability, hazards and exposure. So you need to have, if you want to reduce your risk, you need to work on this aspect. How do you do that? One way of addressing this is adaptation and the other one is of course mitigation. Now adaptation, I said already in a previous example that you can enhance your adaptive capacity through accessing resources, more and more resources. You can also reduce your risk by enhancing your capacity, building your knowledge, building your capacity, training to know how to handle in this kind of situation. So your impact or your risk will get reduced. Remember that risk is a function of hazard into vulnerability by capacity. So if you enhance your capacity, this component, then definitely your vulnerability will get reduced. So then your risk will get reduced. That's a very basic concept. Now risk, we know that it arises from these three components you saw here, right? Vulnerability, hazard and exposure. Now vulnerability is an endogenous characteristics of a system, which is largely determined by its sensitivity and adaptive capacity. Now risk, these three hazard, exposure, vulnerability are involved. Now vulnerability you can analyze through sensitivity and adaptive capacity, right? Now risk can happen from present climate variability, what is right now you can see, you can feel and risk also from future climate change, what you have not seen. Now two scenario, present and future. Now how to handle that kind of situation? So risk from present variability, climate variability of course, again three of these parameter that you have to work with. Here you have to work mainly on present sensitivity and present adaptive capacity. What is happening? You address that right now. Forget about future or past. But in case of future, you know, risk from climate change, your future sensitivity and future adaptive capacity need to be looked at. And this requires some kind of modeling exercises that we have discussed earlier. Okay? Now vulnerability, sensitivity, adaptation, this you can analyze in different way. I just now discussed about this risk function that risk is a function of hazard vulnerability capacity. This is the simplest form. Here you can actually, you can't play with hazard, right? But you can always reduce your vulnerability by enhancing your capacity. So the capacity part is something which is in our hand. So we can enhance capacity through training, through different manner, we can reduce our risk. This is what actually this particular question also tries to explain. Now look at the framework which shows the different approaches that one can follow for vulnerability assessment. Because assessing the vulnerability of a particular system, individual, society, community, area is very, very important. Because on the basis of this assessment of vulnerability, only your future strategy can be built upon. So how you actually can assess the vulnerability? There is already a standard procedure, which IPCC also has given very clearly. Most of us actually follow that framework for assessing vulnerability. Now what you do is that, suppose we identify that there is a need for vulnerability assessment. What should we do? We first define the area or unit for the assessment, means what particular place or particular community need to be looked at. Then we identify the individual institutional stakeholder and partner who are going to be impacted or 
potentially vulnerable. Then we define the objective assessment. One our objective is clear what we are going to assess. Then we carry out the assessment. Identification of definition and indicators, various indicators that we need to find out because for different, for drought we will have a set of indicator, for earthquake, for flood, for different, different you know event we will have different type of indicators. Then we quantify them after quantification, normalization of indicators are done. Then we assign weightage to those indicators. Then we go for aggregation of weighted indicators into various vulnerability indices. Once that is done, then we analyze the results and then we rank them on the basis of priority, then the implementations will carry out. So from here, then let us come this part, implementation part. Once your assessment is carried out, then you move here. So how? So implementation, the adaptation plan. You have to review the outcome of the implementation that you implement on the basis of your assessment. Once you review the outcome of implementation, then you characterize the current state of system for reassessment of vulnerability. Means after your implementation, whether vulnerability has gone down or gone up. So that you have to identify. And once that is done on the basis of that, again probably if you see vulnerability has gone up instead of going down, then again you go for another assessment. And this is the way the process of vulnerability assessment continue. Remember, a good vulnerability assessment decides the fate of an implementation plan, whether that will be successful or not. So that's why your vulnerability assessment on the basis of various information and data that you carry out has to be almost error free. We know that it is not possible because a lot of modeling exercise, secondary data is also involved for this assessment. So there will be little bit of uncertainty, but our effort should be to minimize that uncertainty. Conceptual framework for assessment of risk. Again, IPCC has given a good amount of information, knowledge in their report. So look at that, these three major, what you call actor, a factor of creating risk. So we have hazard, you can also do hazard assessment by identification of the hazard. Then you assess the nature or the strength or the frequency of a particular hazard. You can go for hazard mapping. Again here your GIS remote sensing could play a very important role. We have already discussed about this aspect. Finally then you go for hazard hotspot so that you identify few hotspot where you know probability of hazards is much higher. So that you know gives you some you know opportunity to manage in case of any kind of event to reach there as soon as possible. Vulnerability assessment we already discussed. You have assess the internal or external variability factors to assess the vulnerability. Exposure assessment. Exposure assessment you can carry out by characterizing the exposure by inventorizing the systems of various hazards locations. Then fixed location system like forest and different physical infrastructure analysis. Portable location system also like population or floodplain because population, you know, human being and uh, floodplain actually they can move from one place to the other. Here today there is a floodplain and the water goes and brings some of the land into this river then that part is lost. So this, this kind of situation in Brahmaputra valley is very common in northeast where we call it as a chore land, okay, C-H-A-R. So population and flood plain are portable location system because, you know, they can uh, shift from one place to the other. Now framework for assessment and reduction of risk under climate change, very, very important and these directly actually regulate the availability or accessibility of natural resources to an individual or a community. Now what we need to do? First, we need to define the objective of risk assessment and this should be carried out involving various stakeholders, government, non-government, community, people, anyone whoever is potentially 
impacted by any kind of risk in that particular area. Once you define that then you go identify the hazards, the hazards which are concerned for you, the hazards which are creating risk for you and then you decide the resolution of that hazards, the scale, intensity, time frame for the assessment. When that is done then you go to the third step characterize and assess the hazards, their type, their nature, frequency, intensity, where it comes more, the locations and assess the outcome vulnerability of these systems. Once you have done then you go to the step 4 where you mark those hazard hotspot. Suppose this is an area, this you can mark that these three area are flood hazard prone. So, the system government or any stakeholder will be aware that every you know rainy season they have to be specially careful of this hotspot of a hazard which is flood. Same way you can identify hotspot for many other hazards. Next step, combine the spatial distribution maps of hazard hotspots and the system, priority system location. For what? To identify the priority districts or blocks which are potentially under risk or has the chance, higher chance of potentially under risk means that gives you an opportunity to foresee and keep your system ready for any kind of eventuality. Number six, take up the assessment at the local scale and then identify the site specific factors which are actually causing the vulnerability to the people for that particular hazard, say flood identify those factors, why it is taking in that particular location every time flood, identify those regions, what are making those people in that particular area vulnerable, then only you can address this issue properly. Next, identify vulnerability reduction and adaptation measure. If you find that yes, this particular area will have flood now or then, then you enhance their adaptive capacity, coping capacity in consultation with community, NGOs, government department, bring everyone to enhance the adaptive capacity of the people. If you find that that particular location or the group of people anyway they will have to face flood, then you can enhance their capacity in such a way if any flood occurs they are not going to be impacted beyond a certain limit which is manageable. This is how actually we should process. Now next the approaches of vulnerability assessment, we talked about vulnerability assessment couple of minutes back. Now vulnerability assessment enabling framework is a very talked or discussed topic. Now for minimum you know level of skill, manpower, budget and time frame that is required for vulnerability you know assessment, they actually with minimum skills and manpower or budget or time frame they can actually suggest a assessment you know different kind of level that what level of assessment is actually recommended. Then the next is the utility of the assessment and the final result that you get. So the three different aspect of vulnerability assessment approach under which the different things taking place. Let us see. Now if you have high skill and medium manpower and medium amount of budget and medium time frame in hand, your suggested assessment tier level is tier 3. What you get through tier 3 assessment? This is useful for developing specific adaptation options. What is tier 2? Medium skill, medium manpower, medium budget, medium time frame, tier 2. So difference between tier 3 and tier 2 is in tier 3 you have high skill. In tier 2 you have medium skill, rest all are same. What is the result you are getting? It provides useful guidance and information for adaptation planning. Let us come to tier 1. Tier 1, low skill, low manpower, low budget, short time frame, everything is low when then you have tier 1 assessment level and you what you get? You get preliminary idea about the vulnerability. You can create a demand for tier 2 or tier 3 assessment. So, from here the process starts from tier 1, tier 2, then tier 3. Okay? So, this is how 
the vulnerability assessment approach works in the field. Now, I will quickly discuss about these three approaches or three level of vulnerability assessment. First one is your tire one. Tire one approach is your this approach, okay? where you define tire one approach is basically you define the objectives assessment, then you select vulnerability indicators, then indicators you give the weightage, then you calculate aggregate it and then aggregated indicators values will give you a particular vulnerability class and then you specially profile them and ranking according to the vulnerability classes. So, tier 3 you again define the objective and assessment unit start from there then select vulnerability indicators then you give it indicator value define the weightage of those indicators go for assessment then aggregate them aggregated value then are segregated into different vulnerability classes and finally, special profiling or ranking of those vulnerability classes. Now, tier 2 is the combination of tier 1 and tier 3 where you define again objective or assessment unit follow almost the same path that you have done for the other two tier 1 and tier two okay so basically tire two is the middle one as you saw here in this uh, figure so tire two is the combination of tire one and tire three basically all right now let us compare between these uh, you know three approaches tire one tire two tire three indicator data what you need for tire one secondary data tire two both primary secondary tire 3 mainly primary because tire 2 is tire 1 and tire 3. So, secondary data, primary data both are here required. Data sources for tire 1 government sources, reports, non-government sources also, tire 3, tire 2, tire 1 plus field and PRA exercise. You remember PR exercise we discussed participatory rural appraisal. So, it will require everywhere almost. So, for this also vulnerability assessment you need that. In case of tier 3, tier 2 plus data from national and in international organization, satellite data, climate model data, etc. Then comes application. Tier 1 provides preliminary assessment vulnerability to assist the identifying the most vulnerable systems and this may lead to carrying out tiers 1 and tier 3 assessment. Tier 2 rigorous assessment. It provides useful system details for initiating measures for vulnerability and risk reduction. Tier 3, in case of applications, very rigorous assessment. It informs about the sources of risk and vulnerability. It is useful for initiating action on the ground level. It helps developing anticipatory strategies, initiating long term policy changes for risk or vulnerability reduction data type what kind of data is required for tire 1 mostly secondary tire 2 primary secondary tire 3 primary largely gis and climate data also will be required next is that advantage if we look at the advantages of these three levels tire 1 tire 2 and tire 3 tire 1 is relatively easy and quick for implementation it's also you know it requires less expertise so you can actually get this done with uh, unskilled people semi skilled people low level of investment is needed for tier 1 in case of tier 2 vulnerability assessment stakeholder involvement is always required for improving the acceptability and the credibility of the assessment is useful for adaptation planning and for creating the demand for adaptive actions whereas in case of tier 3 it is useful for developing a site specific adaptation strategy and here stakeholder participation gis and other modern techniques like modeling increases the accuracy and robustness of the analysis of the result what are the limitations tier 1 as it done carried out by relatively low skill or semi skilled manpower. So, it provides only preliminary information about the vulnerability of the system 
on the basis of secondary data, results are less accurate, methodologies are also less elaborate and robust. Okay. Tier 2 requires medium to high level of expertise and it is more elaborated than tier 1, but more time and resource are required than tier 1. Certainly, if you want a better output, you need better skill, manpower and also better is you know higher amount of resources. Tier 3 time and resource consuming and very very data intensive because here your accuracy level is also high and you are going for site specific right site specific adaptation strategy. So, certainly your time and resources will be much more higher requirement. High level of knowledge and skill and expertise is required for tier 3 level of analysis. So, these are all together the various aspect that uh, under tire you know different tires levels of vulnerability assessment that we uh, discussed. So, in the following classes we will get into the uh, different you know aspect of vulnerability and climate change how we actually it can impact the different you know area or different uh, you know field of research related with natural resources management. Thank mm -hmm. you.